Welcome to the second lecture on object detection from uh, the CB3 DST series. Um, so we'll start by doing a short recap on the two-stage detectors, which we saw in the last lecture. So as you remember, um, we have mainly two categories for um, object detectors based on machine learning and on deep learning in particular. And in the last lecture, we saw two-stage detectors. These are the ones that, from an image, they do feature extraction. So this always happens with the CNN. And then they divide the detection into two steps. First, extraction of object proposals. And in a second step, once these proposals have been extracted and selected, one does a classification, so semantic classification on top, whether this object represents a dog, a cat, or a person. And in a second head, one does localization, which is essentially a refinement of the bounding box. So we focus in the last lecture mainly on the RCNN family, which um, is this series of detectors which started in 2014 with this very basic version, the RCNN detector, in which actually one started directly from the bounding boxes and one would actually put a convolutional neural network top and then uh, we would have the classification loss which in this case is performed using support vector machines and also the regression loss which is um, the bounding box regression, the bounding box refinement. Now of course this was extremely slow because the convolutional network was applied on top of every a proposal of every possible bounding box where there might be an object. So this is extremely inefficient. So in the second version of RCNN, called Fast RCNN, actually they realized that one doesn't need to apply the ConfNet on top of the bounding box, but it can actually apply the convolutional network on top of the image and with just one forward pass perform the feature extraction. Now the question is, how do you actually link the feature extraction with uh, the regions of interest, with these object proposals that uh, we actually extract with another method? And what they propose to do is they propose to actually place the regions of interest on top of the feature map, of these features extracted by the CNN, and then perform an operation that they call ROI pooling, region of interest pooling, to actually bring all these feature maps, which now have different shapes because the object proposals have different shapes, and they propose to actually bring them with this pooling operation to a fixed size. And this is because after the pooling operation, we have this series of fully connected layers that actually allow us to connect to the regression head, that is the bounding box refinement, and the classification head for the semantic information. And since the fully connected layers require this fixed size input, this ROI pooling is uh, the faster CNN way of actually guaranteeing that, even though we have object proposals with completely different sizes. So after seeing this, uh, one realizes that the only thing that is not uh, learned, that is not end-to-end -end trainable, is this part here, the regions of interest the object proposals actually come from an external method. And of course, um, faster RCNN, so the, the third version of the RCNN family, proposed to solve this by integrating the object proposal extraction inside the neural network. And they did this actually by uh, using what they call a region proposal network. And the main idea there is that we are actually not going to use a separate CNN to perform this operation, but we're going to use the exact same feature map that we obtain here with this initial CNN to perform first the extraction of proposals and later on ROI pooling that leads us to classification and regression. So with a single CNN, with a single feature map, we can actually perform all of the operations. And the interesting thing here, and, and what has a great link to actually one stage of the object detectors, is the region proposal network. So as you will remember, um, we, we saw in the last lecture, we have this image, the feature extraction, which leads us to this uh, 
um, cube, this feature map of, for example, h by w by 4096. And from this, what we need to do is we need to apply a series of operations to extract proposals. And these operations are, of course, represented by um, layers in a neural network. And what we need to do is, first of all, decide how many proposals we want to extract, right? We need to decide on a fixed number. And where are we going to extract them? And in this case, we actually decide to extract them in a dense way, which means that for every point in this H by W feature map, we will extract several proposals. So as we saw in the last lecture, the RPN consists of um, only convolutional operations. So the first operation is a 3 by 3 convolution that simply reduces the depth of our feature map to 256. And from there, we're going to go ahead and use one by one convolutions to actually shape the depth of our feature map to a fixed number. And actually, this fixed number um, is telling us, has a, has a meaning, right? So it's not just um, a depth like 256, which has no meaning, but actually our depth now after the one by one convolution is going to be 2n plus 4n. And n is actually the number of anchors that we use on each of the spatial locations of this feature map. So on each location of this h by w map, we're going to place n anchors. And these anchors are, you might, as you might remember, um, they are these uh, boxes with a fixed um, scale and aspect ratio. We have a total of nine different uh, boxes with different scales and aspect ratios to kind of cover all possible objects that might be centered uh, on that point on the H by W feature map. And so now essentially what we do with this one by one convolution is we convert these 256 numbers into this nice representation of 2n plus 4n. And we have the first two numbers for a classification between object and non-object. So the numbers that are going to be placed there are going to tell me for each location and each anchor on that location whether that anchor represents an object or not. And then we have four more values to actually perform the box refinement. So the same thing as we had for faster CNN for the final box, we now have it also for the anchors, to go from anchors to refine object proposals. Now this is, um, you can see already how we're going to build one stage detectors, right? So the RPN is a very good step towards one stage detectors. And the main difference between two stage detectors and one stage detectors is that in one stage detectors, we go directly from image to classification of bounding boxes and localization of the bounding box. So we don't have this idea that we actually want to go first through object proposals, prune a little bit the locations in the image that we're interested in analyzing, but we directly go from image to boxes. So this has advantages and disadvantages, as we will see in this lecture. But the main advantage is that one-stage detectors are incredibly fast. So let's start by looking at um, perhaps the most famous one-stage detector, YOLO. You only look once. And um, the motivation behind YOLO is a little bit, um, or it reminds us actually, of the sliding window approach that we use for object detection. So one of the first approaches that we presented in the first lecture of CV3 DST, and that is essentially um, whenever you have, for example, a template of the object, you just slide this template in a sliding window fashion across the image, and you try to find regions of the image that depict a similar object. So this is um, has the, the same motivation, right? the same idea behind it, but we're going to do all of this with convolutional neural networks. Now, um, another important thing is, of course, we cannot slide our window on all possible locations of the image. right? This would not make it efficient. And as we said, one-stage detectors are going to be very fast, so we need to make them efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide our image in a grid and only evaluate um, our, our template on those locations. 
And again, um, I don't want to um, to talk too much about templates, right? Because of course, in neural networks, we actually learn those templates, we learn uh, those filters. But this is just to remind you about this connection between the old object detection that was done with templates and sliding windows and the new object detection, which essentially is done with CNN filters and uh, convolutional operations, which um, again are just taking the filter and sliding it through the image. So a lot of parallelisms here with the old object detection. So essentially the, the, the whole idea, right, is that we take a box and we place it at the center of each, uh, of each cell in this grid. And this is going to be kind of our initial guess for an object. And from then we're going to do a similar thing to faster CNN. We're going to classify this box and we're going to regress this box to better fit the object. So remember this, this main idea and let's see how we actually do this with uh, convolutional neural networks. So as we said, one stage detectors go directly from image to detections. And the only thing in the middle is essentially a convolutional neural network. So in YOLO version two, um, what they do is um, they make use again of anchor boxes, right? So this is very, very similar to the RPN of faster CNN. Essentially, you have a convolutional neural network that extracts a feature map, in this case, a feature map of size seven by seven by C channels. And for each grid location, we're going to decide how many anchors we actually want to have. In this case, we're going to use again this number n. So same as the RPN, we're going to have for each point in this seven by seven feature map, we're going to have a prediction of n anchors. And these anchors again have a different aspect ratio, uh, different scales, and if you actually visualize these anchors on top of the grid, on top of the original image, then you would see um, predictions like this. So in this case, we depict in green the anchors, the initial anchors that were used, and in blue, the actual predictions. So once you perform refinement on top. And so again, very similar to the RPN, what we're going to do is we're going to use convolutions, in this case, three by three convolutions, to go from this depth, this depth C, to a depth that is actually meaningful for us. And in this case, for each base location and for each anchor, we're going to have 25 numbers. And the question is, how do we actually interpret these 25 numbers? So in this case, uh, what we're going to do is not only predict um, between object and non-object, which is what faster CNN did, not only perform uh, bounding box regression, which is this refinement of the bounding boxes so it better fits the object, but in this case we're going to go ahead and we're going to predict also the semantics inside these boxes. So we're going to have these class predictions on top of the object non-object prediction and uh, the bounding box refinement. So we're going to do everything in one step. So this is very similar to actually having an RPN that instead of only classifying object non-object and then allowing a second part of the network to perform uh, the, the actual classification, instead we have an RPN that does everything in one go. But you can see that there is, uh, there's a lot of similarities between the RPN and the YOLO version too. There's another um, quite famous one-stage detector called SSD, and it's very, very similar to YOLO, so it has the same intuition behind YOLO of going directly from image to feature map and then to um, the actual detections in the form of these refined anchors. But instead of doing this from a single feature map, what it does is it performs classification at different scales. So what happens often with object detectors is that we perform these convolutions, right? And we reduce the spatial size of the feature map. 
And in the case of YOLO, we end up with a feature map that is 7 by 7. Now, if your object is really, really small, it can be that it actually gets lost uh, with all these convolutional operations and pooling operations. So the resulting spatial size of 7 by 7 doesn't have enough resolution to actually detect these small objects. So one solution for this problem actually comes from detecting at different convolutional scales. So for example, in this case, in the case of SSD, instead of detecting when you have, for example, the spatial resolution of 3 by 3, you also detect when you have 5 by 5 resolution, when you have 10 by 10 resolution, 19 by 19, etc., etc. And the idea is that you're going to detect the bigger objects at the end, in the deeper layers, and the smaller objects at the beginning in uh, the shallower layers. And the nice thing about SSD is that it doesn't require much uh, extra operations, right? I mean, in the end, we use the same CNN, we use the same feature extraction network, and just by putting a few layers, a few classifying layers on top of each of these, of these levels of convolutions, we actually um, allow our network to extract detections at different scales. So this is kind of a small change that um, it doesn't involve um, much extra parameters. So this is a very cheap way of actually improving your detections. So both YOLO and SSD um, have a series of pros. And the first pro is that they are very, very fast, right? One-stage detectors are much faster than two-stage detectors. Also, they are end-to-end -end trainable because they just contain feature extraction, series of convolutions. So actually, they are fully convolutional, which means that they can take in any image size, or let's say almost any image size. Of course, if the image is too small, then the convolutions end up reducing the image too much. But um, as any fully convolutional networks, they can work with almost any image size. And uh, to compare SSD and YOLO, of course, as SSD uses multiple scales to perform object detection, in the end, it can detect more objects than YOLO. Now, the bad thing about one-stage object detectors is that uh, the performance, at least until recently, is not as good as two-stage detectors. And it has quite some difficulties with small, small objects, even uh, with SSD that actually detects objects at different scales. So what is the main problem with one-stage detectors? Well, it turns out that two-stage detectors have a bit of an easier job because um, the classification and the final regression, but especially the classification, actually only work on interesting foreground regions, right? So you actually pre-select the regions of the image that you know are interesting in the form of these object proposals or these regions of interest. And you only have about 1,000 or 2,000 of those. So most of the background examples, most of the uninteresting parts of the image are already filtered out by the region proposal network. So there's a natural balance between foreground classes and background classes. This is something that you can actually control. And so it's kind of manageable to analyze only these object proposals, these interesting parts of the image, right? So it's much easier if I actually filter out the easy background parts and if I allow my classifier to actually focus on the potential foreground parts of the image. So the thing is that if the classifier only has to work on these interesting parts, it can become much more targeted, right? It can really analyze the content of these foreground images without having to worry about white walls or um, long um, pieces of, of the image that actually represent, for example, the sky of the grass, right? There's uh, no filters, no convolutional filters that need to be spent in analyzing those parts of the image. And so the convolutional filters can actually focus on analyzing these interesting region proposal parts. So what happens with one-stage detectors is completely different, right? So for 
um, all the parts of the image in a dense way, you actually need to analyze a bunch of locations. And this can be up to 100,000 locations, right? And there are a lot of negative samples, right? For example, we have here in this image, all of these anchors, which are placed in a part of the image that is completely not interesting. So there's just background in there. And so we're going to have many, many, many negative examples with basically no useful signal to train our one stage detectors. And we're going to have very few positive examples where we actually see an object, like for example, these uh, green bounding boxes depicted in the image here. And these are the only boxes that actually contain enough information, enough texture, enough shape to actually be analyzed and to actually properly train our object detectors. So there's a huge imbalance between a lot of background anchors and very few foreground anchors. And we can actually do hard negative mining, but it's not really sufficient to bypass this huge imbalance. So in order to solve this, um, in 2017, researchers actually proposed um, to change only the loss function of one-stage detectors to bring the performance closer to two-stage detectors. So let's recall um, what happens with the cross-entropy loss. So we have in this case the shape for a cross-entropy loss. And we can see that for a very hard example, right, where the predicted probability is very, very, very low, we get a loss of, let's say, 2.5. Now, for a very easy example, this has already been classified properly, right? The probability is actually almost uh, at 1.0. And the loss that we get for these easy examples takes a value of 0.1. So what happens in practice is that we have very few hard examples, right? The examples that we would actually want to focus on, these, these foreground objects, for example, and we have these 100 hard examples. So if you multiply these 100 hard examples by 2.5, we get a lot of a loss, total loss of 250, for example, for this mini badge. But since there is this huge class imbalance, we have a lot, a lot of easy examples, examples that we know are background, but there's a lot of them. Let's say 100,000 easy examples. So even though the loss is very, very tiny, even though for each example we get a loss of 0 0.1, which is much, much smaller than for 2.5, when we actually multiply the number of these examples, 100,000, by 0 0.1 for each example, we actually get a huge total loss of 10,000. So essentially what happens here is that the easy examples are actually driving our training because the loss for these examples is going to be huge compared to the loss for the 100 hard examples. So in RetinaNet, what they actually propose is um, how about we change the loss so that um, this imbalance affects the total loss um, in a different way, so that these easy examples don't have so much weight in the total loss. And for this, they actually propose to use the focal loss, which is um, depicted by this formula here. So, um, as we can see, this total loss depends on uh, PT, which is depicted here in the x-axis as the probability of the ground truth class. And it also has this parameter gamma. And this is a very interesting parameter. So, when gamma is actually zero, then we can see that the formulation is exactly equivalent to the cross-entropy loss. So, we can see it depicted here, the blue curve, which is very similar to the curve, it's actually the same curve that we saw in the, in, the other, in the previous slide, where if you have a very low probability of ground truth class, we have this 2.5 loss, and where we have this high probability of ground truth class, then we had this loss of 0 0.1. So for gamma zero, focal loss is essentially the same as the cross-entropy loss. Now, the interesting thing happens uh, when gamma actually goes towards 1. So we can see how the curve 
for the focal loss changes, we can see that for gamma 0.5, we, we have this red curve here. For gamma 1, we have the yellow curve. And essentially what is happening here is that all of the easy, the easy examples are being downweighted. So now if you look at value, for example, 0.8, instead of having quite um, a high loss here, maybe 0.2 for gamma 0, we maybe have 0.1 for gamma 0.5 and even lower when gamma is 1. So essentially, as gamma goes up, the easy examples get less and less value um, in their loss. So for example, when gamma is 2, we see here in this, in this purple curve, and if the probability of ground truth class is actually 0.9, then the focal loss is 100 times slower than the cross-entropy loss. So this means that there can be 100 um, examples um, that are very, very easy, very, very well classified already. And these 100 examples will have the same weight as one easy example with the cross-entropy loss. So you can see like this how it's much easier to handle this imbalance between easy cases and hard cases with a focal loss compared to the cross-entropy loss. And so on top of that, they actually put a very powerful feature extraction backbone, which is ResNet. They also do multi-scale prediction like SSD, and they use nine anchors per level. And each of these anchors actually has uh, the classification and the regression head, like we had for YOLO, for faster CNN. And with this, actually, what they showed is that they have a very, very good performance. So you can see here a comparison. On the x-axis, we have the inference time. So, of course, with um, a larger backbone, for example, retina net with a ResNet 101 um, backbone, it takes a bit more time to actually compute results than with a RetinaNet 50, which has a ResNet 50 backbone. So, half the number of layers. So, as we can see here, the performance of uh, RetinaNet is in general much higher than the performance of YOLO, SSD, and other detectors that are depicted here. So, for example, um, SSD is depicted here. So, this is the performance of SSD. And even though fast, the RetinaNet 50, the fastest RetinaNet 50, is much, much better in terms of accuracy. Now, the funny thing is that uh, the YOLO authors didn't stop there. So they actually had a third version, YOLO version 3, um, which is actually very powerful which is very, very fast, as you can see. So it even goes outside of uh, the scale of RetinaNet. And the performance is actually really good. So it's not as good as the best RetinaNet, but it's really, really fast. So we have seen um, both in one-stage detectors as well as um, two-stage detectors. One thing that is actually not learned, that actually needs to be decided a priori, and these are the anchor boxes. So one might wonder, can we actually perform object detection without anchor boxes, without having this, this decision where we actually have to fix the scale and the aspect ratio of the anchor boxes, right? So of course, this limits us in the type of objects that we can detect. So one would ask, can we actually get rid of these anchor boxes? And this is where one-stage point-based detectors come into play. So um, in 2018, so this is really, really recent work, people started thinking, can we actually um, use another parameterization of bounding boxes that allows us to predict them without the need to have anchors? And in the work CornerNet, what the authors proposed actually was to use only two points to express a bounding box. And this would be the top left and the bottom right corners of a bounding box. So you can see here a picture of these two persons and we have a bounding box around them. And by just defining um, these top left and bottom right corners, we actually have the full definition of a rectangular bounding box. 
So what they propose to do is they propose to use neural networks to directly predict these corners and to extract boxes from them. So how corner networks is um, you perform um, same as all detectors feature extraction with a convolutional neural network. And then one would have two heads, one head that would predict heat maps for the top left corners. So this map actually indicates for each location of this feature map how likely it is that I find a top left corner of a bounding box. And then you would have another head that would do the same. It would actually um, depict what is the probability of finding bottom right corners in the several positions of the feature map. And once you have this right, um, the only thing that you need to do is to match top left corners with bottom right corners. So um, the first, the, the, let's say the detection step happens with these heat maps, right? So the probability for each corner type is what is going to define the probability of having a box or not. But there is no notion of a box yet with these heat maps, right? So what we need to do is we need to match the top left corners with the bottom right corners. And in order to do this, what the authors propose to do is to actually use embeddings extracted directly from the convolutional neural network feature maps. And what these embeddings would tell you, um, or what these embeddings represent, is actually a signature, an identifier, for this top left corner. And the goal here is that this identifier, this signature here, which in the end is just a vector that represents this point, should be very, very similar to the vector that represents the corresponding bottom right corner. So in this case, the top left corner for the green box and the bottom right corner for the green box would have very similar embeddings, very similar signatures. And the same would happen to the top left corner and bottom right corner of the orange box. So the first step would be extract the, this probability map for each corner type, top left corners and bottom right corners, then extract embeddings for each of these corners, and then simply perform box uh, creation by doing matching between these embeddings. And of course, once uh, the bounding box has been predicted, we can actually predict the class of the bounding box on top. Now, CornerNet used an hourglass network. Um, this was originally published in a work in 2016 for human pose estimation, and we will cover human pose estimation in a few slides in this lecture. So I'm not going to talk about the architecture right now. But the idea is that you perform a feature extraction step with this hourglass network, then you have your top left corner heat map prediction, bottom right corner heat map prediction, and finally you have your prediction module which gives you the heat maps, the embeddings, and also actually offsets to refine these bounding boxes. The thing is that, um, so the question is why, why do you actually need these offsets, right? I mean, if we're already predicting points, isn't this accurate enough? But the thing is that, of course, um, we're going to predict corners at a lower resolution, right? Because our feature map is going to be reduced. And so it's much more efficient to actually predict the corners at a lower resolution and then allow for this bounding box regression, this offset prediction. So it's like the bounding box refinement, the bounding box correction that we saw in faster CNN, in YOLO, in all the other methods. So this is going to be exactly the same here. And it allows us to be a bit more efficient because we can predict corners at a lower resolution. So one of the interesting things that they propose in CornerNet is actually a way of solving the ambiguity in defining a corner of a bounding box. So let's assume that we want to define the top left corner. And what happens is essentially that inside the box, so if we have to define the top left corner, over all of this left side of the box and the top side of the box, there is actually an ambiguity in defining this corner, right? So for the network, the coordinate could be 
in any of these positions here. Where there is one pixel more to the right, two, three, four pixels more to the right, this is actually very hard for the network to predict precisely. So what they actually propose to do is they say, well, all the points that are still inside the box, so in the case of the definition of the top left corner, this would mean all the points that are below here on this left side and to the right on this top side of the bounding box, we, um, so the authors actually consider all of these points to be um, good for the corner prediction or actually to be valuable for the corner prediction. So what they propose to do is they actually propose to do max pooling or what they call corner pooling. So they take all of these values here, they do max pooling and they put the max on the top most predicted position. Right, so it's like they take all of the values here, which might be good values to define a corner, and they pull them all to the top position. And they do the same actually when pulling all of the values of the, of the top of the bounding box, so to the right, they just pull them all the way to the left. So in, in doing this pulling from bottom up and from right to left, they can actually define a much more precise output for the top left corner prediction. Of course, corner net is not perfect, right? So um, it turns out that there's a lot of false positives predicted with corner net, especially incorrect small bounding boxes. So it's kind of easy to create small bounding boxes with corner net. And it, the hypothesis of why this happens is that it is also really hard to infer the class of the box because the network is actually focused on the boundaries, right? It's, it's not really focused on the middle of the object, it's focused on defining the corners, right? So when you actually have to perform classification on top, there has been a lot of effort of feature extraction into defining good features to extract corners. So when you actually need good features to extract information about the center of the object, for example, classify that object into a semantic class, then things uh, get harder for the network. So after corner net, people said, well, wouldn't it make more sense to actually predict the center of the box and not the corner? Right? So what they actually say is we can use the corners as proposals, right? but we're going to have also a head that predicts the center. And this is mainly to verify the class of the object and to filter out outliers. So you can see here the backbone of this network, which is similar to corner net. Then you have your corner net head, which essentially means corner pooling, corner heat map prediction, embeddings and offsets to actually predict some sort of proposals. And then you would have the center pooling and the center heat map, which will actually predict the center of the bounding box. And essentially it would be used as kind of a, of a filtering for the proposals. So you see here that when you're predicting the center, you're kind of uh, forgetting about these small objects, which are false positives, this orange box here, this blue box here, they have no centers predicted here. So by predicting only these two centers, you can actually filter out a bunch of outliers that you get from here and match corners to centers to obtain the final bounding box prediction and to also improve the class classification for these objects here. But once you're predicting points, you can actually ask yourself, um, do I still need to keep the bounding box representation? I mean, this representation is not really ideal, right? Because if you, we see this example here of the giraffe, you know, the, the green corners actually uh, are touching the object, right? They lie on the object. So they might be meaningful to actually detect. But if we had to detect the red corners, these are just in the middle of background, right? Why would this be a corner? It's very hard for a neural network to actually detect that the red points are corners. 
So it might th there might be an easier way to actually detect an object for a neural network rather than with this bounding box representation. And especially if we focus on points and not on anchors, why do we actually need to keep this bounding box representation? So um, essentially what the extreme net uh, people propose is to get rid of this uh, prediction of the red points as corners by the CNN, right? This is too hard for a CNN to do. And instead what they propose to do is actually represent objects by their extreme points. So their extreme points are essentially the, for example, the rightmost point of an object, like we see here for the tennis player, this is the rightmost point that still lies on the object. So now what we're going to do is we're not going to predict corners that are outside of the object, but we're going to predict extreme points that are touching the object. So for example, rightmost point, the top uh, point, the bottom point, but these are all points that lie on the object, not like the points of the bounding box, the corner of the bounding box, which would actually all four be outside the object. So the idea here is that for a CNN, it's much easier to look at edges and to find what is the extreme point of an object rather than to find a random uh, corner of a bounding box, which is kind of an artificial representation. So essentially what they propose to do is they say, um, we're going to predict a left heat map for the leftmost point of the object, a top heat map, bottom heat map, and right heat map, right? So this express the probability of a certain location in the image being a leftmost corner, topmost corner, bottom, and rightmost um, extreme point for the objects. Then um, you will extract the peaks. So you would have all these possible points that are, you know, bottom points, left points, etc., etc. And in order to actually predict the final bounding boxes, what you have to do is combine all these points, right? So there are different combinations between left points, top points, right points that actually create an object. So th there is a different number of combinations that you could use here to create different types of objects. And how they actually propose to do this is um, not by using embeddings like we used in CenterNet before, but actually using center heat maps. So aside from predicting left corners, top corners, um, or extreme points, shall I say, so left extreme points, top extreme points, bottom extreme points, and right extreme points, what you're going to read also is possible center locations for the object. And then essentially what you have to do is take all the peak combinations, right? For example, this is one possible peak combination, creates this bounding box, but it turns out that the center of the bounding box does not correspond with any center peak, right? So, so there is most likely no center there. Now, once you hit the right combination, it turns out that it votes for a center that actually has a high probability of being a center. Then what you do is you take this, uh, this bounding box and you accept it as a final bounding box. So essentially extreme net, what it does is it predicts extreme points that are touching the object. It then votes for a center location. It checks whether the center location is indeed predicted as a center or not. And then it accepts or rejects the bounding box that has been created. So it turns out that extreme points were commonly used before, uh, especially for annotation, right? So there are several works um, that actually propose um, that a user clicks extreme points of the object, and then um, an algorithm would automatically extract um, the mask of the object or the bounding box of the object. And this is essentially uh, to create ground truth, right? So we need a lot of ground truth annotations to train neural networks. and um, it's, there, it's actually very valuable to devise methods uh, for efficient annotation. And so um, what the authors of ExtremeNet do is actually they use uh, this work here, Deep Extreme Cut, to actually go also from extreme predicted points to uh, natural object segmentation. So aside from obtaining a bounding box, they also obtain a plausible um, segmentation mask for the object. 
Okay, so um, we went through several methods, uh, two stage detectors in the last lecture, one stage detectors uh, using anchors and one stage detectors using points in this lecture. But uh, there is still something that we haven't covered. And this is actually how do you evaluate all these detectors? So how do you decide that a detector is better than another detector? So we have presented some curves, but we haven't really gone through how um, to perform this evaluation. So let's start by defining some basic concepts. So first, the concept of true positive. That is when we actually predict a bounding box, and this bounding box nicely overlaps with our ground truth bounding box, like for example, the penguin here. Then we have false positive. This is when we actually predict the box where there is no object. And on the contrary, false negative, when we actually do not predict a box where we do have an object. So using these three values, what we're going to do is we're going to define two measures. One is uh, the precision. And this basically measures how accurate your predictions are. And the precision is defined as the ratio between true positives and the sum of true positive plus false positives. So essentially in the denominator, you have all the boxes that you detected. Right, these boxes, two things can happen. Either the boxes actually match a ground truth box, then we have the true positives, or the boxes don't match any ground truth detection, which means that they are false positives. So the sum between true positives and false positives are all the boxes that your algorithm actually had as output. So the, your algorithm thinks that there are this amount of boxes, this amount of objects in the image. So this is your denominator, and from this, you take in the denominator only the good boxes, only the true positives that actually match the uh, ground truth. And by this, what you actually measure is the precision, right? So if you actually detect very few boxes, but these boxes are all correct, then you have a very high precision. If you actually start detecting a bunch of boxes and only few of them are correct, then your precision is really low. So, of course, you might say, well, I'm going to be conservative here and I'm going to tell my method to only give very few but very confident boxes, right? Then my precision is very high. Well, it turns out that there's another measure that we're going to use together with precision and that is recall. And that is um, basically measures the coverage of the ground truth. So how good was your method? are actually finding all the ground truth bounding boxes. And for this, what we're going to do is we're going to have at the denominator all the ground truth boxes, right? So these are the boxes that you correctly detected, true positives, plus the boxes that you didn't detect, the false negatives. These, the sum of these two are actually all the ground truth boxes. So we have this at the denominator, and at the denominator we have only the good boxes that you detected, so the true positives. So basically what this measures is from all the bounding boxes that are in the image, how many did you detect? So if we now go ahead and say, I'm going to have a very conservative method that just fires few bounding boxes, what you're going to have is you're going to have a very high precision because almost all are going to be correct, but you're going to have most likely a very, a very low recall because you will not have covered all the ground truth boxes that there are in the image. If on the other hand, what you do is you fire detections here and there, it's very likely that you have a very high recall because you're going to find all the ground truth bounding boxes, but your precision is going to be very low because you're also going to have a lot of false positives all around the image. So the other thing that we need to define is um, what is actually a positive, right? So when I say that there's a true positive is because the bounding box that I have predicted and the ground truth bounding box kind of overlap, right? So, so they are actually in the same position and they represent the same object. How we actually measure this is by using the intersection over union or the Jacquard index that we saw in a previous lecture. And what we say is that 
If the intersection of reunion is above 0.5, then we have a positive match. Then we consider this to be a true positive. Now, um, the IOU can be 0.5, it is 0.7 on other data sets, which means that the boxes have to be more precise to actually be counted as true positive. So essentially, we're going to judge true positives or we're going to count true positive, false positive and false negatives based on the intersection of our union with ground truth boxes. And so we actually now put all of this together, right? Recall, precision and the way to compute this with true positive, false positive and false negative. We put everything together to create one value that is actually going to judge object detection. And this is the mean average precision. So we actually assume that we can detect different semantic classes of objects. And so what we're going to do is for each image and for each semantic class independently, we're actually going to rank the predicted boxes. So the boxes that my object detector gives me, we're going to rank them by confidence score, right? So you take an image, you predict your objects, you take one class, let's say person, and you run all the boxes that have been classified as person by confidence score, like the, the most confident boxes at the top and then all the way down to the least confident boxes. Then you're going to assign the boxes one by one according to this order of confidence. You're going to assign the boxes to the corresponding ground truth based on the intersection of our union. And of course, we want that each ground truth box is only matched to one predicted box, right? So you start with the most confident box. If it overlaps more than 0.5 with the ground truth box, then you assign it as a true positive. And then that ground truth box essentially disappears, right? It has already been matched. So it cannot be matched to any other prediction. Now you do this for each class independently, right? You have several uh, precision, several recalls. And then what you're going to do is you're going to compute the average precision per class. And once you have the average precision per class, then you compute the mean overall classes to obtain the mean average precision. So now the only thing that we need to define is actually what is exactly this average precision, right? We talked about recall, we talked about precision, but what is this average precision? So essentially how I compute this is, as I said, I'm going to rank my predictions by confidence, right? So I have, for example, 12 boxes that I have detected for the class person. And it turns out that all of these boxes are not assigned to ground truth boxes, right? So there's only six of these boxes that are actually true positives and the rest are false positives. So this is indicated by the green T for true positive and the red F for false positive. And this again, I compute in order by using the intersection of our union. So now let's see uh, what are the precision and recall values for each of these predictions. So I start with the first prediction. Um, so as I said, I have these 12 boxes, six of them are true boxes. And what I want to compute now is the precision and recall values, right? So I have for the first box, it's a true positive. So, so far what I did was I predicted one box and it was a true positive. So my precision is one and my recall is 0 0.17. So out of the six ground truth boxes that I have, I have detected one of them. So now I'll go further. The second detection is also a true positive, which means my precision stays high, 100% precision. And my recall also doubles because now I have two out of six boxes detected. The third one, though, is a false positive. So this doesn't affect my recall, right? Because uh, the recall doesn't involve false positive, but it does lower my precision. And so essentially what I do is I keep computing precision and recall for each of these boxes until I reach recall 100% because I actually have detected all the boxes with my true positives. But as I said, I had 12 box predictions and only six were true positives. So it's only fair that at the end of the day, 
I have a prediction of 0 0.5. Now, what I'm going to do with this computation is I'm actually going to create a graph. So I'm now going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to plot precision versus recall. So you can see in the x-axis that I have the recall, which has, in this case, it could reach uh, all the way to 1 if I detect all objects. And on the y-axis, I have my precision. So I start with a true positive, so my precision is 1. For the second point, actually, it's also true positive, so I keep my precision, as I said before, and uh, what is actually going up if, is my recall. So this is why I'm going further to the right in my graph. Now, for the third point, I have this false positive, which means my precision goes down, but my recall stays. So again, false positives don't affect the recall. So I go through all the points further and forth, further, until I have my full graph. So essentially what I did is exactly the same as I did before, computation of precision recall, only that now I have plotted it in this graph of precision versus recall, which is in the x-axis. And now finally, I can compute my average precision. And actually what my average precision is, is the area under this curve that I have um, nicely drawn here with these true positives and false positives. Now, to be precise and, and for easier computation, what is done in practice is to compute the area under the field curve. So essentially, this, this pink region here are also going to be counted for uh, the area that actually defines the average precision. So essentially, the average precision comes from a precision and recall uh, curve that I'm going to draw with my detections that are going to be ordered according to the confidence score and then assign true positive or false positives based on the intersection of our union. So no one might ask, well, how do I actually um, force my network not to predict a bunch of bounding boxes, right? This might lead to a very high recall, but my precision is going to be very low. And then the result is that my average precision and mean average precision is also going to be very low. So this I want to recall the concept of non-maximum suppression that we actually presented in the last lecture. And that is actually applied to all two-stage detectors, one-stage detectors, and sometimes even if in another shape, in the one-stage point-based detectors. So remember the concept of um, selecting ground truth boxes for training, right? So this is the slide that we had for uh, the RCNN family. So at some point, of course, you have to create labels for the ground truth bounding boxes so that you can actually compute your loss, right? And the first thing that you need to do is you need to evaluate how much your anchor actually overlaps with the ground truth bounding boxes. So how you actually define this is, again, with the intersection of reunion. So you say, if my anchor overlaps more than 0 0.7 intersection of reunion with my ground truth box, I consider this anchor to be a positive, right? So I consider then my P star to be 1, right? This is actually a positive example. And the negative examples are all those anchors that overlap less than 0.3 intersection over union with any ground truth box, right? So a box that is really placed outside of an object. Now remember, there are all the objects in the middle, so all these anchors that have an IOU between 0.3 and 0.7 are basically ignored, right? So you want to have really strong signal for really confident boxes above 0.7 IOU, and really non-confident boxes, or let's say anchors where you are certain that they represent background. Right, so now the, the thing is that you might imagine how densely you place the anchors, right, and all the shapes and all the, all the um, aspect ratios. So it's very, very likely that there's more than one anchor overlapping more than 0 0.7 with your ground truth bounding box, right? So if there's more than one anchor that gets a positive signal during training, it's very likely that in your predictions, 
you're going to have more than one prediction per, uh, per object, per ground truth object. Now, if I fire three bounding boxes that more or less overlap with my object, then I'm going to have high recall because I'm very likely going to be detecting that object. But I'm going to have a low precision, right? Because now out of three boxes, only one of them can be matched to the ground truth box. So I want to kind of clean out the output of my detectors. And remember that we actually did this with non-maximum suppression. So we have, for example, the CNN that is predicting all of these boxes, all of these yellow boxes, as an output for objects in this image. Now, how NMS would work is, again, you would order your boxes based on the confidence score. And then you will start with the first box. So the first box is the most confident region. It overlaps nicely with the ground truth object that depicts this dog, and therefore this region remains. The second most confident is also an object that overlaps nicely with the, with the dog, with the ground truth bounding box for this dog, so this also remains. And we have a third box that depicts the third dog. It also overlaps nicely with the ground truth, so this also, also remains. Now, the question is what happens with the other regions, right? So we, we know for sure that there are no other objects in this image, but will the NMS also erase all of these bounding boxes? So it turns out that the fourth region nicely overlaps with region one, which we have already kept, <clears throat> and it overlaps more than a certain threshold that we define for the NMS. So remember, the maximum suppression always has this overlap threshold which is a parameter that we can tune to actually get more or less boxes. So if you have a high enough threshold, actually region one and region four overlap more than this threshold, and then you can remove bounding box number four. It turns out that all of the boxes that are now depicted in black can be removed based on the overlap they have with ground truth boxes with boxes that we have already considered as objects, so boxes one, two, three. But there is one box that um, we have to evaluate, box number eight, which is actually not going to overlap enough with the confirmed green boxes, so with either box one, two, or three. It's not going to overlap enough to actually reject it. Right? So there is this threshold of the NMS, and if the two bounding boxes don't overlap more than this threshold, then we're actually going to keep region number eight. So what is eventually going to happen is that we're going to have these four confirmed predicted bounding boxes, which is not too bad, right? We had a lot of bounding boxes to start with, and the NMS actually managed to erase a lot of these boxes and keep only four, which are three true positive and one false positive. Now, the NMS and the sensitivity of the threshold of the NMS is actually a big problem and is especially a problem with highly overlapping objects. So we see in this case, um, this scenario in which we have a blue object, it's highly confident, it's a nice true positive, but we have another true positive depicted by this um, green bounding box, which is highly overlapping with the blue object, right? So these are, for example, two persons walking, one uh, behind the other, and actually they're overlapping a lot, their, their bounding box is overlapping by 0 0.5. And so uh, we would actually like to detect both of these boxes. The problem is that we also have another box, which is this red box, which is actually a false positive, but it's also highly overlapping with the blue box. So what happens is that if we are very strict with the NMS and we have a threshold of 0 0.4, what's going to happen is that both boxes overlap more than 0 0.4 with the blue box, and so we're going to remove both boxes. Hence, what's going to happen is that we're not going to be able to detect the green box, and so we're going to have a false negative. On the other side, if we have a very relaxed NMS threshold, and we say if the overlap is above 0 0.6, then we delete the box, this means that we're going to end up keeping both boxes, because they both overlap less than 0 0.6. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have our green box detected, this is good, but we're also going to have a false positive, which is the red box. So you see how the NMS um, is actually key towards detecting highly overlapping objects, but it's also not possible to just 
get a higher average precision because you run the risk of just creating a bunch of false positives if you make this threshold a bit more loose. So once we have seen detection that goes uh, beyond anchors and hence beyond boxes, one might think, can we actually apply the same principle to detect other things which are not objects in the form of bounding box? And it turns out that with deep learning, we can do a bunch of things, uh, a bunch of predictions as points. We can, of course, extend 2D bounding boxes to 3D bounding boxes. So it's not only about predicting center, width, and height, but it's also about predicting the depth and also about predicting the orientation. So if you add these, uh, these two components, then you can go from 2D uh, bounding box prediction to 3D bounding box prediction. Now, of course, the center uh, is also now three-dimensional, but aside from this, the only thing you need to add is a couple of values in your neural network output. We can also predict other things, like, for example, facial landmarks, as few as five facial landmarks that just uh, suggest the position of the extreme points of the eyes and, for example, the tip of the nose, or a full description of the face with many landmarks, as we can see on the left image. And we can also predict, for example, body joints to perform human pose estimation. So I want to go a little bit more into detail there. And uh, I want to, to kind of send across the message that this is not so much different to actually detecting bounding boxes, to detecting objects. The only thing that we need to do is find a new parameterization. So before we had this parameterization for boxes of corner points, extreme points, center and width and height, top left corner plus bottom right corner, whatever parameterization you can think of. Now, of course, uh, detecting the pose um, and all the body joints of a person is a bit of a more complex task. So what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, the COCO parameterization, which says that we have 17 joints to localize. So for example, we have left ankle, right ankle, left and right knee, top of the head, etc., etc. And of course, uh, this parameterization is just a definition that we need to have because we need annotations. We need ground truth for these body joints. Therefore, we need to agree upon a parameterization of um, the body joints that we want to detect. And it turns out that the human positimation problem is not as easy as it sounds. Um, so we have a lot of occlusions between the different body joints. We have clothing that actually doesn't allow us to see the actual joint of the person. We have also extreme poses, as we can see here in these images. We have viewpoint changes that, of course, uh, the object, the body, is in 3D, but we only see the projection in the 2D camera plane. Therefore, um, the same pose as seen from different viewpoints means that we'll have to predict completely different um, locations for the body joints. So actually, it's a quite complex problem. But it turns out that we can definitely um, tackle it in the same way that we tackle object detection. So for example, we can do direct regression. We have um, this image with um, a body with different joints in there. We can extract features using a convolutional neural network. And from our feature map, we can directly predict the positions of the body joints with a series of fully connected layers. So instead of having us output the corners, for example, of the bounding box, now we're going to have the 2D locations X and Y for each of the 17 joints. Now it turns out that we can in fact do a human pose estimation by direct regression, but there is a better approach. And this is the approach of the heat map prediction. So very similar so, to how, um, for example, ExtremeNet did um, the prediction of bounding boxes by computing these heat maps for the top left corner of the image or um, of the object, sorry, or, or the bottom um, part, the bottom extreme point of the object. Um, by predicting this um, through heat maps, we can actually do the same when we're actually trying to predict joint positions. 
So instead of directly regressing a position in an image, so an X and Y location, what we're going to do is we're going to predict a heat map. So on the full image, we're going to look at a location and um, estimate the probability that that location depicts, for example, the left ankle. And it turns out that this is a much easier problem, right? So the same um, logic that we used before to say, hey, it's going to be really hard to predict the actual location X and Y for, uh, for an object bounding box because we would need many instances of that object placed all over the image to actually be able to have all of this rich output. The same goes for the joints. So it's much easier to um, evaluate at each location in the feature map, is there a joint or not, is there an ankle or not, than to actually regress the X and Y position. So this is why heat maps actually work better. So it's a much more powerful representation and so um, this is actually the representation that most of the works in human post prediction are going to use. Now, um, one question is actually how do we find the ground truth, right? So we need to define the ground truth heat map, which is actually constructed by placing a 2D Gaussian around the actual joint position. So you don't really want to have a, a ground truth heat map, which is full of zeros and just one in one pixel, right? Like, this is really bad uh, to get a good gradient signal because you would just get a gradient on this position where you have the actual uh, one value. Instead, what you do is you take a Gaussian and you place it around the joint position, for example, in this paper with a variance of 1.5 pixels, so that you have more pixels that actually contain some values. So they contain some gradients um, that you can actually compute on those pixels. Right. So in this case, you would have lower and lower values the further away you go uh, from, the, from the actual joint position, but you would still get some gradient that would push you to the actual center of the Gaussian, which is where you have the joint location. And then you actually use uh, the mean squared error between the predicting and the ground truth heat map as a loss to train your human pose estimation network. Now, one question that you might ask yourselves is, uh, what happens to the inherent structure of the problem, right? So, so the body parts are not independent. These predictions of left wrist and left elbow are not independent, right? So there is a physical connectivity between the left elbow and the left wrist. So when I actually make the prediction of the left wrist, it has to depend on the prediction of the left, of the left elbow. Um, there's also joint limits, right? So the elbow, for example, cannot bend backwards. There are body symmetries. So all of this structure that this problem has, the structure of the kinematic chain, is something that is not present in the human pose estimation with the CNN. So we want to actually bring this structure to the problem. And how one can do this is by actually using graphical models. So this was already done in the 2014 paper uh, that we saw in the previous slide. And it, it went even further in this paper, Deep Cut, here, which was presented in 2016. And the idea here is that you have all of these joint detections as provided by the CNN. So these red crosses are all possible joint detections in this image. So what you do first is you use the graphical model to actually cluster the joints based, first of all, on joint type and also on target ID, right? So we have several left elbows. Some might belong to one person, some might belong to another person. And then you further solve uh, the graphical model to obtain the final predictions. So it's not only about um, detecting the type of joint predictions, but in this case, the graphical model can also be useful to disambiguate between different people. And if you can actually not use a graphical model on top, but you still want to find the pose of several targets, what you can do, of course, if you can, is you can separate the problem into two sub-problems. First, performing object detection and then searching for the body joint positions only inside 
that bounding box so that you're sure that you're not mixing the left elbow of one person with the right elbow of the other person. So another work that I want to mention in, in the human pose estimation field um, is the one that actually proposed a new architecture that actually improved the prediction, improved the, the precision by which uh, neural networks were able to predict joint positions. And this was uh, the stacked hourglass architecture. So the idea of the stacked hourglass architecture is that you do a series of bottom-up and top-down processing, one after the other. So by bottom-up, I mean that you go to a high resolution to a low resolution using convolutions and poolings. And then you do the opposite operation. So you go from the low resolution to the high resolution. So let's look a little bit more in detail uh, into this uh, particular architecture, into one of these um, hourglass architectures. So this architecture has received a lot of, a lot of names, hourglass, unit, autoencoder type of architecture. And the idea of this is that you first scale down the resolution of your image with this convolution and pooling operation, right? So this is the, the classic operation that we have seen in object detection, in image classification, where you actually reduce um, the spatial resolution and you increase the depth of your feature map. But now um, it turns out that you cannot do all of the operations that you want at this small resolution. So if you, for example, want an output which is, um, for example, one semantic class per pixel, then you need to have the same resolution in the output as you have in the input. So you need to somehow go from this low resolution feature map all the way back to the original resolution. So essentially, instead of having only this downscaling of resolution, you also have an upscaling step where you actually do upsampling plus a series of convolutions until you reach the original resolution. And so this hourglass or unit architecture has an encoder part, which is the CNN part that we're used to seeing, the normal convolutional filters plus pooling. And then you have a decoder, which actually consists of upsampling layers plus a series of convolutional filters to further process the image. And now the idea is that every time you encode the image, you get information from all around the image, you understand the content of the image in the encoder phase. And in the decoder phase, you basically decode it into whatever output you need. For example, a segmentation map. So let's take a look um, into the, the actual decoder, which is the part that we haven't seen, we're not really used to seeing. Uh, which consists of these upsampling layers, which are these red layers, which actually are the, the opposite of the pooling operation, right? So they take this low resolution feature map and they scale up, they augment the spatial resolution. And after this augmentation, of course, we need still to do some processing. We need a series of convolutional filters that are going to process this upsampled version of our feature map. Now, uh, the convolutional filters in the decoder are learned. So they are normal convolutional filters, yeah, like you have also in the encoding. So they are learned using backpropagation. And again, their goal is actually to refine the upsampling that we did. But why do we actually need this refinement step? Well, this is because um, in the hourglass case, for example, we have a very, very simple upsampling. So we actually have upsampling by interpolation. So imagine that we have to go from this 4x4 four four representation to an 8x8 representation, right? We have to upsample our feature map. Now we can take the 16 values of the 4x4 four four feature map and just spread them across the 8x8 feature map. But we will still have a lot of locations depicted here as white squares uh, where we don't know what kind of value to put in there, right? There is no value. Um, that comes from the 4x4 four four representation that we can actually copy-paste in there. So what we're going to do is we're just going to interpolate those values. So we're going to take nearby green pixels 
we're going to take their values and perform, for example, linear interpolation. Um, so the effect of interpolation, if we have this tiny original image here and we actually want to upsample it 10 times, is uh, different depending on the type of interpolation that you do. So you can do nearest neighbor interpolation as the, um, the hourglass does, which essentially means that you go to a pixel that has no value, you look at the nearest neighbor and you simply copy the value of the nearest neighbor. So you see this kind of block effect that this interpolation creates. You can also perform bilinear interpolation, so looking at how far the neighbors are and weighting uh, their value according to how far they are to the pixel that you want to fill, or you can do more complex bicubic interpolation. So in any of these, of course, you can see that uh, the content, the main content of the image is preserved, but there are many artifacts. There are either block artifacts or blurring um, output. So these outputs actually need to be refined with further convolutions. Now, aside from um, the upsampling and the convolutions, there is something that is very, very important in the hourglass architecture and that actually makes the whole thing work. And these are residual connections. So if you remember, the recent architecture as we explain it in introduction to deep learning this is a very very similar concept here so you have here the hourglass architecture that goes from high resolution to low resolution and again back to high resolution but now what we're going to have is we're going to have special connections that are called residual connections or skip connections that are actually going to connect feature maps in the encoder with feature maps in the decoder of the same size. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to take the feature map of the encoder and we're going to sum it directly with the residual connection to um, the feature map of the same size in the decoder. So you can see that we have these residual connections at different levels, the highest level, mid-level all the way to the lower level. So we have all of these summation operations here. And essentially what you do here with these skip connections is you preserve the spatial knowledge at each resolution. right? So as you go from high resolution to low resolution, the spatial information is lost because you go always to lower and lower resolution. And what this skip connection, what this residual connection allows you to do is to pass along this spatial knowledge through the skip connection. So you can imagine that you have spatial knowledge <clears throat> through the skip connection, and then you have all the semantic knowledge that you're just gathering from high resolution to low resolution. So you're really understanding the semantics of the whole image. And you have all these semantics concentrated in the low resolution. But then when you add scale, you have lost the spatial resolution. And this spatial resolution is then added again through these residual connections. So this is a key element of units of, of the hourglass architecture that actually allow you to still have very nicely defined high resolution outputs. So essentially what the stack hourglass architecture does is it takes this hourglass or unit architecture as we have defined it and it just repeats it um, time after time. So you can see here in this depiction that we have four hourglass architectures, one after the other, high res to low res to high res again, then again repeating this process from high, less, high res to, to low res, repeating this process several times, hence the name stacked hourglass. And the whole idea of the stacked hourglass architecture is that you make a prediction and then you refine your prediction several times with this process of the hourglass, understanding the scene more and more. And finally, you make your final prediction. So you can imagine it as a prediction refinement step. And you actually uh, might imagine that you do only a prediction in the final step. So you have your loss only in the final step. But it's actually much, much better if you have also intermediate supervision. 
And what this essentially means is that if you have the hourglass n, so it's not the first hourglass, it's the nth hourglass that we have in our stacked hourglass architecture. And this hourglass can already give you a prediction, a prediction of where the body joints are going to be. And this prediction is now in this, in this blue rectangle here. And what we actually do is we perform intermediate supervision. So we put a loss in there. We actually compute the loss that tells us whether this prediction of body joints is good or not. And then this prediction is actually reintegrated into the network with one by one convolutions and with this, again, summation operation in here. So for each of the hourglasses, you're going to make a prediction, you're going to compute a loss on this prediction, and then you're going to continue computation. And this is essentially called intermediate supervision because you not only have the loss at the end, but you also have all these intermediate losses that actually help a lot in improving your predictions, in making your predictions better and better. And the authors of the paper actually show empirically that this intermediate supervision helps, right? So what they do is they compare their architecture, which is um, the light blue architecture up here. So you have two hourglasses and you have the loss computation at two points, intermediate supervision and final prediction loss computation. And they compare it with a stacked architecture, but with only the loss at the end with only one hourglass architecture with one loss computation, with a big hourglass architecture with loss computation at the end, and with a big hourglass architecture with loss computation at several points. And the goal of this comparison is actually to show that two hourglasses are not better than one hourglass just because we have more parameters but that is actually better to have the two hourglasses that go from high resolution to low resolution to high resolution and repeating this operation and then putting the supervision in the middle. This is much better than having, for example, a single very large hourglass, as we can see here, with only one loss computation. And it's also better than having a large hourglass, so also the same number of parameters as a double hourglass with some intermediate loss computations, but that you don't really know uh, what they are supposed to be, right? So you know that at the end of one hourglass, you can have an appropriate joint prediction, while the predictions here are going to be at a lower resolution and hence the loss computation is going to be less helpful. And in fact, as we can see here, the light blue hourglass architecture with intermediate supervision has the best accuracy. Of course, the size of the network has a huge impact because you can see that the half hourglass has a much, much lower accuracy than the other architectures which have double number of parameters. So this is still uh, the most important variable that plays a huge role in the accuracy of the human pose estimation network. And what we can also see uh, in the paper is actually, very interestingly, um, the prediction accuracy in intermediate layers. So we have discussed that they have several hourglass architectures and therefore they have several intermediate predictions. And so one might wonder what is the actual accuracy of these intermediate predictions? Maybe it's already good after one or two hourglass architectures. Well, it turns out that if you have two hourglass architectures, the intermediate prediction is quite good, but of course lower than the final prediction in terms of accuracy. So this y-axis is the total accuracy for the body joint predictions. If we have more hourglasses, we see that the accuracy steadily increases, though it saturates at some point. And of course, when we have a lot of hourglasses stacked one after the other, we start from a much lower accuracy, but we quickly reach a higher accuracy at the top towards the end, towards the final hourglasses. And now you might ask, well, I've understood all the human pose estimation methods, but let's say that I actually want to go to real life and I want to have a code that does human pose estimation in a robust way. What kind of method should I use? 
Well, in this case, I would actually propose to take a look at this code, open pose. So you can see the kind of results that they get here, right? Crowded environment, and they can still separate and detect all of the skeletons really nicely. They also have facial landmark detection, hand joints detection, very detailed hand joints detection, and, and feet uh, joint detection. So they really have more than 100 joints being detected in this, in this code. So if you have uh, to look for a code online to do pose estimation, I would recommend you to take a look at this one. Okay, so in these two lectures, lectures two and three of uh, CB3 DST, we have seen many methods for object detection going from two stage to one stage to one stage point-based detections and finally more fine-grained detectors like um, the ones used for human pose estimation. So we are in a pretty good stage um, in the sense of analyzing images at least in a coarse way, so in the way of placing a bounding box around objects. So now there's two things that we can do, and these are the things that will actually define um, the next lectures. There's actually two things that we can do, two domains in which we can expand to actually improve the understanding of the scene from a camera, which is in the end what we're interested in doing in this lecture. So we can look at the temporal domain and we can extend detections to the temporal domain. And these are going to be the next two lectures that are going to focus on object tracking. So not only getting bounding boxes on each image, but actually linking these bounding boxes in time. And then we can look at the spatial domain. So are bounding boxes the best representation that we can actually get? So we have already hinted that there are better representation than bounding boxes. And of course, the best representation are uh, object masks. So actually assigning for each pixel, you know, is this pixel belonging to this object class, to this object instance, or does it belong to background? Does it belong to road? Does it belong to building, car? We want to have a pixel-wise description of the scene. And this is what we're going to do in lecture seven and eight. And finally, of course, we want to combine everything. We want to combine everything the, in the spatial domain and in the temporal domain to actually target the task of video object segmentation. So this is what we're going to do on lecture nine. And um, as you might see here, there is actually lecture six um, that I, I haven't forgotten to mention. This is kind of a special lecture that we will do on trajectory prediction. So it's not about analyzing the current frame uh, of a video or analyzing a set of current frames of the video, but it's more about predicting the future. And in this case, we're going to see whether we can predict the future trajectory of pedestrians in a scene. And finally, we will have lecture 10, which actually takes all of these notions into the 3D space. Thank you for your attention and see you at the next lecture.